Good morning, and welcome to the 9 a.m. Contemporary Service. My name is Nick Hoyle, and I want to welcome you this morning. On behalf of myself, the praise team, and everyone who has contributed to make this production possible, we are excited you have decided to join us for worship today. Pastor Cindy will be talking about how God can do things through us that we cannot imagine. That sounds pretty interesting to me, so I can't wait to hear what she has to say. Today is Sunday, July 25th, the last Sunday in July, and the 9G service is meeting live in the Activity Center. We will be socially distanced, however. Everything will be live. The welcome message, the scripture reading, the prayer, the sermon, everything except the music. Unfortunately, it will be videotaped. And as always, everything I have said is subject to change. Now, if you don't feel comfortable attending the live service, don't worry. This service will continue to be recorded so you can still watch this service anytime you have the time. We also have a traditional service at 10.30 a.m. that is live streamed from our sanctuary, or you can attend that 10.30 service in person. We do have a website you can make prayer requests on, peopleofgrace.org, as well as support the Ministries of Grace through e-giving, and you can view past services. Next week, Sunday, August 1st, the 9G service will be outside, on the grass, under the trees, weather well, permitting, of course. Our first two outdoor services, one in June and the other in July, were well attended, and the weather was beautiful. So we hope the trend continues. One final thought. We are targeting Sunday, September 12th, as the first Sunday we will be back to normal. Hopefully. So grab a cup of coffee, tea, or one of your favorite beverages, and join us as we worship together today.
I invite you to join me in prayer from the beauty and serenity of the Lacey Garden here in the courtyard of Grace United Methodist Church. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we celebrate this day you have called us together, whether in person gathered with our brothers and sisters or from the safety of our own homes. For we know that wherever two or three are gathered, you will be among us. We come to experience the power of your spirit to transform our lives, to open our hearts and eyes and inspire us to action. We come seeking different things, but trust you will meet us wherever we are in our journey. May the peace which passes all understanding, which has its source within the very nature of Father, Son, and Spirit, be with us as we meet to still our souls and join our hearts as one. May the gentle whisper of the God of peace speak to us through our worship, the reading and understanding of scripture, and be the message of our lives as we leave this place. Amen. Our scripture continues from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Welcome to Grace. I'm Pastor Cindy. We have a lot of opportunities these days to act like Christians whether it's masking for someone else because they feel afraid or advocating for those on the margins, supporting those who need a hand up, praying for those who are suffering, showing mercy and kindness with a meal or just a smile, seeking peace and justice in the world. Well, some days we do that really well and we can consider ourselves to be a stunning Christian success. Other days, well, I'm grateful for a God who loves us unconditionally. But sometimes we might wonder if there isn't more to all of this than just acting like a Christian. In this third chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, there are 30 times where Paul uses the terms in Christ, in him, and in whom all referring to Jesus 30 times. To be a Christian in Paul's words, you're to understand your position as Paul does, to say, to believe the words, I am in Christ. Remember our name tags from a few weeks ago? That's our identity. I am a child of God in Christ. We're continuing in our series, No Longer Strangers, a study of Paul's letter to the people of Ephesus. In our readings over the next few weeks, Paul will be more specific about what being in Christ looks like in our lived experience. But today, we explore this passage that lies between the first few chapters that describe our identity in Christ, and then the last few that will teach us how being in Christ causes us to live differently. In this passage for today, which is well known, you've probably heard it many times, Paul stops to pray for the people of Ephesus, and so for us. If Paul knows anything, it's that praying is the way to being in Christ, and praying is the way to live in Christ. 
See, prayer is more than communicating our needs, expressing our feelings, fulfilling an obligation to God. Prayer invites God's presence with us. When you pray, you are admitting that you recognize the existence of our Creator God. And more than that, when you pray in the name of Jesus Christ, you're confessing that you recognize that it is in Christ that we can come before God the Father. Prayer is power. Now this can all get very theological very quickly. We can start launching into a lot of churchy language that causes the brain to pause and seize up in some cases. If I begin trying to explain to you the, the theological reality of the perichoretic coactivity of the triune God, chances are your brain would sort of float until I say something that jerks you back to the present. And the very same thing happened in Paul's day. Wired as they were for self-preservation, self-advancement, and status-seeking, the people of Ephesus were lacking the cognitive categories to understand the reality of God in the love of Jesus Christ, communicated to them by the Holy Spirit. It just wasn't something they had ever known or lived before in that culture. For them, divinity was something to be obtained or earned or strived for or achieved. And so rather than trying to give it words, Paul prays that the Holy Spirit will prepare their inner being, giving them the categories so that they can grasp the love being offered, to grip it, to hold it tight, to live it. And some will do just that. Some of these early Christians accepted Paul's prayer. The Holy Spirit prepared their spirits and they began to grasp the love being offered. They took it into their very beings. They allowed it to permeate their bones and their blood and their brains, and they let it overflow from their lives, living with the confidence that it was all true. It was real. But some didn't, and Paul was speaking to them as well. There are many for whom faith just doesn't make sense. There are those who got it at one time, but now feel far away. But even for these, Paul indicates the Holy Spirit can sensitize your heart so that you can know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge to be filled with the fullness of God, whether for the first time or once again. In the book of Revelation written by the Apostle John, there's a letter to the church of Ephesus from Jesus that came to John in a vision. The letter says, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance. I know that you can't tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and I have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for the sake of my name, and that you have not grown weary. Jesus is telling them they're doing all the right things, but he continues, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. It's easy to do all the right things, to act like a Christian, but to miss out on the love that God is in Christ. And so we're back to Paul's prayer. Because if we want to go beyond acting like a Christian to being in Christ, this is where it begins. We read of so many throughout history that once knew of God in theory, but had not yet grasped the love that God is and lived it in their lives. Those who lived as Christians in principle, but not in reality. And we can read about their transforming experiences so we know that it happens. Blaise Pascal was one such person, a mathematician, scientist, inventor, philosopher. 
He was just barely past the age of 30 when he saw something unexpected one raw November night. He described it as fire. The vision so branded him that he sewed the record he made of it into his coat and carried it with him the rest of his life. It was found there at his death. The note reads, the year of grace, 1654, Monday, 23rd of November, from about half past 10 at night until about half past midnight, fire in all caps, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and of the learned, certitude, certitude, feeling, joy, peace, God of Jesus Christ, my God and your God. Your God will be my God. Forgetfulness of the world and of everything except God. He is only found by the ways taught in the gospel. Grandeur of the human soul, righteous Father. The world has not known you, but I have known you. Joy joy, joy, tears of joy. Wow, what an experience. We also know the story of the founder of Methodism, John Wesley. Wesley was a scholar, a learned theologian, an expert in Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and a scientist of sorts. He could express his knowledge of God from a young age, but it wasn't until he experienced the love of God that it became real to him. On May 24th, 1738, he wrote in his journal, In the evening I went unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation and an assurance that given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. If you read Wesley's sermons after that point, you generally find something to this effect in them toward the ends. Amen, Lord Jesus. May everyone who prepareth his heart yet again to seek thy face receive again that spirit of adoption and cry out, Abba, Father. Let him now come again and have power so to believe in thy name as to become a child of God. You see, this prayer of Paul's is a prayer of power that opens us to this kind of experience not one of pure emotion, but one of the reality of God coming upon us, sharing with us the love of Christ, all through the power of the Holy Spirit. Those aha moments open our minds and our hearts, bring us to recognize our needs, accept our limitations, open us to healing and to new life, even if they bring us first to the uncomfortable position of being on our knees before God. Grasping the love of Christ is like that. It comes to us in one of those kinds of moments. Paul brings this passage to us from that uncomfortable position on his knees. In those days, it wasn't common to pray from your knees. People stood to pray. But that was the position of respect before God. Being on your knees was the posture of urgency, of defeat, a reflection of Paul's deeply felt need to convey his message. Remember that this letter was likely among those that Paul wrote from prison in Rome. It was the strength gained by being in Christ that inspired him to the point of inspiring others, even as he himself was imprisoned. How is it that we can experience one of those aha moments if we aren't imprisoned or like John Wesley or Blaise Pascal facing that dark moment of the night? Like Paul, we can pray. Paul prays so that we won't lose heart and give up. 
Paul prays so that we won't forget the power available to us through the Holy Spirit. Paul prays so that the Holy Spirit will strengthen us with power, but not just any power, the power to grasp the love of Jesus Christ. Praying opens us to God's presence and makes all the gifts of Jesus Christ available to us as we are one in Christ. Paul adds another element to the prayer that is important for us. We don't receive this power on our own. Paul prays that we may have the power to comprehend, not alone, but with all the saints. See, we need the community of faith to go with us. We need to hear the stories of others, to share our stories, and to allow others to help us see where God has been working in our lives. We need the church. All of this is to say that I cannot convey to you what it's like to grasp the love of Christ. There are days when it overwhelms me to the point of tears, and days when I can't make sense that there even is a God. In the book, Floodgates, Holy Momentum for a Fearless Church, author Sue Nilsson Kibbe writes about Mother Teresa's prayer and her life. One of the great prayer warriors of our generation, she kept countless prayer journals that chronicled a passionate daily prayer life throughout her entire vocational ministry years. The fruitfulness God brought through her to impact so many lives with God's tangible love became legendary. Most would assume that Mother Teresa enjoyed a brilliantly vibrant partnership with God through her dedicated prayer life. But 10 years after her death, in 1997, we learned differently when a book of her personal letters taken from her prolific prayer journals was published. It's called Mother Teresa, Come Be My Light. And it revealed that her prayer life for many years had been dark without any sense of the light of God's presence. And yet, Mother Teresa always continued to pray, even in what she named as years of unemotional and blank darkness. And in hindsight, it's evident that God continued to work powerfully and consistently and faithfully in and through her prayers whether she felt God alongside her or not. Thankfully, God is patient with us. But I would challenge us as a community of faith to be less patient with ourselves, to be less than satisfied with unemotional, blank, dark, spiritual lives, and to pray fervently as Paul did. To him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To be open to the possibilities before us as the church moves into an unknown future. And to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever as we all experience what it is to be in Christ together. Amen.
When God's presence comes with power to revive us, change occurs at the deepest levels. Prayer may have seemed like a chore, but instead we find that it invites us to see everything differently. We go from striving to being empowered, and we can know the love that cannot be known and live in all the fullness of God. God in the power, God in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So go in that power to love and to serve. Amen. May the 